So many things to do and say I can seem to find a way But I wanna know how I don't know how I know But first I gotta find myself But I don't know how Oh, why do I reach for the stars When I don't have wings To carry me that far I gotta have before branches to know who I am before I know who I want to be in faith to take chances to live like I see a place in this world for me sometimes I don't want to feel and forget the pain is real put my head in the Start to run and then I fall Thinking I could get it on Without my feet on the ground There's always a seed Before there's a rose The more that it rains The more I will grow oh, Gotta have roots Before branches To know who I am Before I know who I wanna be And they Take chances to live like I see a place in this world for me. Oh, whatever comes, I know how to take it. Learn to be strong, I won't have to fake it. Oh, you're understanding. Oh, when it comes and do its best. Blow me north, south, east, and west But I'll still be standing Be standing if I have roots Before branches To know who I am Before I know who I want to be In faith To take chances To live like I see A place in this world Gotta have roots before branches to know who I am. Before I know who I wanna be in faith to take chances to live like I see a place in this world for me.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's wonderful to see all of you as we celebrate this service of baccalaureate for our seniors, their friends, and families. This baccalaureate service is part of our commencement tradition and a really important part. But it's a different kind of celebration from the one in which we'll gather tomorrow. Much of this weekend is very busy, like much of our lives. But baccalaureate provides a moment for reflection and for gratitude. It celebrates those particular parts of our students' lives here in which they did not merely learn or do, but in which they also made connections, took time to reflect on the meaning of things, gained a sense of vocation, and thought about what matters. Students came to these understandings, as we all do each, in their own way, through their faith traditions, their families, their friendships, their academic learning, their world, and particularly by coming together in their deepest moments of loss and in their most soaring joy. Today's ceremony was created by our seniors as a way of expressing those experiences and those understandings, and especially as a way of expressing what is sacred to each of them individually and to all of them together as they have grown over these four years. I would like to thank Chaplain Alex Serna Wallander and each of the students who have planned and are contributing to today's service. I'm also delighted today to thank and welcome Dr. Emily Welty, class of 2000. Dr. Welty's commitment to peace and justice through her research, her teaching, her leadership, and her advocacy has made a major contribution to international nuclear disarmament and thus to the safety of people around the world. For Dr. Welty, the connections between faith, family, and humanitarian engagement are central. And we are so fortunate today to be able to hear her message. Our service this morning is broadly reflective of the broad religious and faith diversity of this class. For many people, a sacred gathering that brings together many different faiths is unfamiliar. It's still quite a rare thing in our world for people of different religions and of no religion to sit respectfully and joyfully side by side for an occasion of prayerful reflection. I think that that makes the fact that we do it here all the more important and indeed its own reason for gratitude. So I hope that you enjoy this morning's service and that you find that it offers you a chance for reflection and for gratitude as well. Especially gratitude for the gifts that these seniors have been to all of us and for all that they will do in the world after they graduate. So we will now receive a call to prayer brought to us by Mohammed and Jaye. Mohammed? Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. Hayya ala as-salam Hayya ala as-salam Hayya ala al-falah Hayya ala al-falah Allahu Akbar Allah Akbar. La ilaha illallah.
Good morning, senior class of 2018. We made it. Congratulations on your hard work, resilience, and patience. I stand before all of you today to share my perspective on growth and transitioning from one phase of life to the next. My perspective comes from life experiences rather different from most of yours. And yet, my college experience has shown me that we are not that different. I was 13 years old when my father brought us to the United States from the majority Muslim West African nation of Senegal. My strengths come from my faith in Allah and my Muslim traditions. No matter where life takes you, I have no doubt that every graduating senior here will positively contribute to the world. Throughout our four years here, everyone can attest to several times where they had to overcome many challenges. However you choose to fight your battles here, we must admit that a good perspective combined with the right mindset and a positive attitude never goes in vain. In this very emotional stage of our lives, hopeful yet uncertain for many, we must now more than ever have faith and stay optimistic for what the future holds. Just like we've had to overcome many challenges during our college experience, we should expect nothing less moving forward, simply because life without challenges wouldn't be as rewarding. In the second verse of chapter 29 of the Holy Quran, God says, do the people think that they will be left to say, we believe, and they will not be tried? This verse relates to our current situation, whether you're fighting a battle that no one knows about, or you're scared and nervous about your future. Here, God is telling us that all believers on earth will be challenged at one point in time. That challenge could be something like going from a familiar territory to an unfamiliar one, as we're getting ready to do. Hold your head up high and face your challenges. But most importantly, in doing so, find comfort in being uncomfortable. No pain or grief lasts forever. And as emphasized in the Holy Quran, chapter 94, verse 6, with every hardship comes ease. Therefore, we shall overcome any obstacles moving forward. Life is not that rosy for some, but everyone has a different struggle and having faith in the Lord, his mercy, his generosity, and his justness can take us a long way. I urge you all to take a moment at some point today to not only acknowledge your achievements, but to visualize your success. You can be great at something you don't believe in. Go out there and make a difference. I will end at this last verse of hope from the Noble Quran, chapter 39, verse 10. O you servants of mine who believe, have fear of your Lord. A good end awaits those who did good in this world. Allah's earth is spacious. Verily, those who preserve shall be granted their reward beyond all reckoning. You can go anywhere and make a difference. No matter what obstacle you face in your postgraduate journey, know that God's earth is spacious and that everyone has a place in it. You are as important as anyone else, and it is God who provides, so do not despair. Do your part and leave the rest to God. Thank you. You have to be patient for a tree to grow. Like my brother's small plant, every day it gets a little bigger, stronger, and though you may not see it in your lifetime, your tree will grow into a beautiful resource, a celebration. I would plant my wondrous ideas, my insightful contributions, my respect and gratitude, and a place in this world. I would plant my talent and hope, my hopeful decisions, my determination, my loves and hatred, and of course, my dreams and my belief. Proverbs 3, 17 through 18 in Hebrew. Eitz chaim hi lamacha darche noam v'chol nativotecha shalom. And in English, it is a tree of life for those who hold fast to it, and all who cling to it find happiness. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace.
Hello, everyone. I'd uh, like to say a few words about a friend of mine that's particularly dear to me that unfortunately couldn't be here with us today. I'll be talking about how we met, the context of our friendship, and a few other things you probably didn't know. Now, this friend of mine was a once in a generation type of person. He was the quiet, unspoken glue that held the foundation of our football team. He was an exemplary student and athlete and the embodiment of the Fighting Scots spirit. He was the definition of someone who did the right thing, no matter who was watching. I have never known someone with the character, integrity, and the sacrifice for the team that he did. He won't be remembered for how good he was at football or for being a straight-A student. No, when we think of the memory of my friend, I will remember his character, ethics, and the integrity that he conducted himself with every day. This is the story of Clayton Guide. No, we met the first day of classes in our freshman year, in Spanish class actually, and I saw the Worcester football polo that he would wear, and being a big football fan, Naturally, we just had a lot to talk about in that class. I, even though neither of us had the slightest clue of speaking fluent Spanish from day one, it was very apparent that he was not afraid of a challenge. Being a very studious person was one thing, but from studying together, I could tell of the fortitude, yes, he was a bright student, but what most impressed me was his unwillingness to concede to difficulty. So, towards the end of the year, when it was time for housing selection, I was going to ask him if he wanted to room together the next year, and he actually chuckled and said that he was about to do the same thing, so that solved itself. Now, coming into our sophomore year, being on different schedules was rather difficult, but we made it work. Now, once again, I went to every single one of the home football games, and I saw the pounding that he took for his team. Now, he would come back with bruises all over his body, and he would just say that he's doing his job of protecting the quarterback. Now, I was introduced to some of the football players through him, many of whom I was already friends with, and it got me thinking. So, with some persuasion from him and one of the football coaches, I made the choice to join him and my friends on the team the next year. So, something that you may or may not know is that, unfortunately, his mother passed away before that year. So, he told me, and of all times, it was right before finals week or freshman year. And I feel like sophomore year was the year I truly got to know him, but it allowed us to grow closer together. And I always say this, I believe this with all of my heart, that you only truly get to know someone when they're facing adversity, not finals week adversity, but life and death back against the wall adversity. I believe that a person shows their true colors when they're at their lowest, and it showed. He didn't cave in. No, instead, he dedicated himself to football and his academics in her memory. Going out was out of the question. Many people who didn't know him thought it was a bit odd how he never went out, but he actually had a pact to her to finish his degree, and he stuck with it. So coming into our junior year, as I joined, we created a whole new level of camaraderie. Day after day, sweating out of practice together, you learn a lot about someone's character. Seeing his effort and his fortitude really rubbed off on me, and we continued to improve as a team. We didn't have any classes together, but it was always a great pleasure engaging in rhetoric and deliberative dialogue with him at meals. It was really great having another friend on the team, and it made the transition much easier. So coming into our senior year, we knew things were going to be different. We knew that this was our last year. There was a higher sense of urgency. We were 3-0 and after the black and gold weekend game, up until the end. Now, with our futures at hand, we knew that this was going to be a stressful year. So about a week before he passed away, we had promised each other that no matter what happened, we would summon every last ounce of energy and pursue our dreams to the fullest of our abilities with the honor of each other. So I'm not going to waste time with a generic story. There is one thing that I can recall him saying that will stick with me for the rest of my life. We were talking late at night once, and he said, I can't wait for my 21st birthday. And I asked him why, thinking most college students are excited for their 21st birthday for a certain reason. <laughs> so he said, silly, no, I'm not excited because I can drink. No, I'm excited because when I'm 21, I can become a legal organ donor. And I was absolutely awestruck. I didn't know what to say. 
So I asked them, why, you know, when you're 21, 22, 23 years old, so young, it's hard to get a perspective on things. You're in the prime of your physical life. It's the last thing that comes to mind. So he told me, if I'm ever in a situation where some freak accidents happened and I'm on my deathbed, and if there's 0% of a chance that I can ever get back to my previous self, but at the same time, if I can cut my suffering out, and at the same time, give just one or two people a second chance at life, something that I never had the chance to experience, I would do it in a heartbeat. So, I think that speaks a lot about his character, and it's a testament to who he is as a person. I was hoping that he would never have to use that card, if he only knew that, uh, yeah. Excuse me, one second. That day, he saved the lives of 18 to 20 people. He had a huge impact on not only my Worcester experience, but on who I am as a person, which I will carry with me forever. He certainly made his mark. So now my question to you, my fellow Finding Scots, in the class of 2018 is, how will you? Thank you, God bless. I'll be reading an excerpt from The Clock is on Time by Carrie Edwards. The clock is on time because a thought is an object within a thought, an oncoming proposition of a possible position, a reference to clocks on the body as an object without a memory, a memory without thoughts, because the future, the future will resemble the past, because we want our colors to match, because on a supposition resembling something that could happen, because the hand that shook the hand of another mislaid thought is based on an object that relates to the clock. Because maybe what matters is a seat in a new convertible. Because what matters is good theme music, an antidote to putting the horse before the cart. Or a thought with an anecdote. Because the object could swim before it could walk, like interchangeable silence is a demand. For, for milk in your pudding, because we are doing the doing, which is based on the bones of direction. Because matter is everywhere, and like a hammer, we feel the touch before meaning. Remember touch through memory, as an object with destiny, that wrote an essay. Something that astonished someone, that's now a thought in time, has a past. That's now newer than before, before it could ever be a question. Thank you.
Jeremiah 29, verse 11 through 13. For I know the thoughts I have toward thee, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and yet ye go to, shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. When I first started my academic career at Worcester, I faced many challenges and was unsure of what my future would hold. For example, after my first semester at Worcester, I spent all of my winter break contacting graduate schools to see if I met their criteria um, and contacting Worcester professors with the intent of possibly changing my major. However, the scripture helped me in realizing that through every obstacle, I have an opportunity to see the amazing plans God has in store for my future. So, class of 2018, as we leave the College of Worcester, I pray that we grow in grace and knowledge and pursue careers that are fulfilling to us. Although we might stumble in, during our journey, I urge us to never get discouraged. I leave you with a quote by author Mary DeMuth. God knows the plans he has for us, and ultimately, he will give us a glorious future. But as we walk out of our lives, walk at our, sorry, but as we walk out our lives at, on this crazy earth, let's remember that the best growth comes through persevering through trials, not escaping them. And when we learn perseverance, we find surprising joy. Congratulations to the class of 2018. And now I have the incredible honor of welcoming Dr. Emily Wetley, Wetley, sorry, Dr. Emily Wetley, class of 2000. Dr. Wetley, well, sorry, Dr. Wetley is not only the director of peace and justice studies at Pace University, but she also serves as the main representative to the United Nations for the International Peace Research Association. And in 2017, her and her colleagues at the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, also known as ICANN, received the Nobel Peace Prize. Dr. Welty holds her time at the College of Worcester as a pivotal moment in her life and growth as an advocate, and it is wonderful to have her back. Welcome, Dr. Welty. <laughs> It's such a joy to be with you this morning and to be some small part of the end of your uh, College of Worcester journey on campus. Um, Worcester was a critical place, is a critical place in my own sacred geography, and it's sort of a starting place on, in the map of how I became who I am now. I was once at the wedding of a friend who had gone to Worcester with me, and the room was full of Worcester alumni. And we were somewhat ecstatically catching up on all things Worcester. And at some point in the evening, my date, who for all of his other good qualities was not a Worcester graduate, <laughs> turned to me and said, Emily, I sort of think that if Worcester was a person, you would marry them. <laughs> and I think he imagined that this was a joke. And I looked at him and said, um, obviously. Obviously, if Worcester were a person, I would marry them. <laughs> so in keeping with the theme of growth and time for today's baccalaureate service, I've been thinking about my own time here at Worcester. And I decided to go back and read the angst-ridden journal of my first semester. One of my favorite feminist thinkers, Cynthia Enloe, says that there is much to be learned in the practice of fruitful embarrassment. That in trying to look directly at the earlier selves that we inhabited in the world and to try to use our own embarrassment to say something about those earlier selves, we might actually say something meaningful about the capacity of humans to change. So two things immediately jumped out at me when I looked at this journal. And the first was the very first thing that I wrote on that first day at Worcester, the self that I was sitting in front of Kauk for that um, initial class photo, a tradition I was so happy to see that you um, continue to do as I admired your class photos yesterday in Lowry. 
So I wrote, someone today, so glad I was keeping track of the details here, someone today gave a speech to us. <laughs> College was off to a great start for me. <laughs> someone today gave a speech to us and they said that the term university originally meant where you find your place in the universe. I really hope that happens. I really hope I find my place in the universe. And then, a few weeks later, I wrote, I don't know exactly what the occasion is. Side note, the occasion was homecoming. I'm not really sure how I missed this detail. <laughs> College was a real learning process for Emily Welty. <laughs> I don't know exactly what the occasion is, but the campus has been invaded by alumni, and I am annoyed. <laughs> I don't think the Worcester that they remember has anything to do with what this place means to me now. So when I look at these alumni, I can't help but think, there's nothing you can tell me. You and your generation broke the world and now we have to fix it. <laughs> and then I think, maybe that's a little bit ageist. <laughs> yes, indeed, Emily of the past, it might be a little bit arrogant, a little bit hasty, and a little bit ageist. But I guess what I worry now is that maybe I was also a little bit right. So what I have to offer you this morning might be better seen in light of the first thing I ever thought about Worcester that it might be a place where you begin to find your place in the universe. That the Worcester was the place where I became more fully who I am now. And so there is an invisible thread that runs between you and me. Even if we've never met, something that at our core we have in common. This geography, this architecture, even this architecture. the rhythms and textures of life on this campus, the feeling of bricks under your feet, and the way that the clock sounds at the library when you hear it after dark. The ethos of this place has created a gentle but persistent tie that runs between you and me. You are part of a very large community composed largely of people that you will never meet. There's a sophisticated term for this, and since we, you and me, are lifelong learners forged in the common fire of independent studies and the inquiry-driven liberal arts education, perhaps you will indulge my desire to teach you one additional thing. I've been sustained intellectually, emotionally, spiritually by the idea of fictive kinship a term originating in anthropology that explains the fierce bonds that we form outside of our family of origin. Bonds based on something that go beyond our obligations to people who are our genetic kin. And it is the power of fictive kinship that leads me to go out of my way to approach a stranger in a shopping mall in rural Virginia or a stranger in an airport in Singapore if they are wearing a Worcester sweatshirt. I do not think for one moment that this is erratic behavior. <laughs> I assume that this person and I share something in common. And even if our interaction is nothing more than a brief acknowledgement of that common bond, that both of us will reference a shared ethos and will feel a little bit less alone in the world. I don't do that with alumni of my graduate school programs or even my hometown. In fact, I might choose to actively avoid an extended conversation with members of either of those groups. And of course, fictive kinship is also one of the most powerful ideas in most religions. Though we are more likely to frame it discursively as the beloved community, the Sangha, the Uma. Religion has framed our obligations to the wider community as a duty that goes beyond whatever we might owe to our immediate or extended families. But we also get glimpses of the power of fictive kinship in other places too. 
When you are the member of a sports team and for one euphoric moment, you are bonded in the pure endeavor of applying your bodies to a common task. When you take a final bow on stage at the end of a performance and you look at your fellow actors and out into the audience in the faces of the lighting crew and the director and you think, we made a beautiful thing together. It is the moments you feel quite tangibly that you are not just the place that you came from, you do not belong just to the people who met you first, but that you belong to the world that you are at home in the universe, and that it is a place where you are supported by very strong ties with people who share something profound with you. In my life, I felt this most powerfully in the course of activism, to stand together with people and say that our common commitment to the good of humanity supersedes my individual need for security or comfort to commit ourselves in a public way to saying that the lives of strangers of people we may never meet, demand something of us. I've always been slightly troubled when I hear activists talk about engaging in protest out of an obligation to their children or grandchildren. Because while I guess that's nice, and it's certainly a better motivation than bystanding or inaction, it also feels a little bit insular, a little bit bounded by family. And I really believe, in the words of Cornell West, that justice is love made visible. That what it means to be a person in the world is to love not just our friends and partners and our families, but to love the stranger, the person I may never meet. That I am in the world to change the world. That I somehow am here to carry on the work of the ancestors and not just the ones I am related to by blood, but ancestors in the struggle that we can name and we can choose. Ella Baker, Dorothy Day, Polly Murray, James Cohn, Marsha P. Johnson, Abraham Heschel. I have been so well loved, so carefully shepherded by people in the world to whom I owe so much, friends who have filled in the gaps, mentors who have parented me, elders who have had the courage to call me out. And in this tradition, these fictive kin form the fabric of what I owe the world. These acts of protest, and in the past year, these long hours at the United Nations, working on the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons that we won the Nobel Peace Prize for this year. This was not for the children and grandchildren that I do not have. They were not even for the niece and nephews that I do have and so dearly love. But these are acts of public love for strangers that I am probably never going to meet. They are for the survivors of the two nuclear weapons that my country dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This love is for the indigenous communities where we tested nuclear weapons, for the people in the Marshall Islands and Kiribati that became laboratories for our nuclear fantasies. Last week I was having lunch with a friend and they asked what I was thinking about talking about this morning and I started talking about fictive kinship and they started making this face. and said, I don't know, Emily, on Mother's Day? <laughs> you know the speech is on Mother's Day, right? Just keep in mind, Emily, blood is thicker than water. As an empirical statement about viscosity, <laughs> I don't, I mean, I don't know, maybe. But as a statement of meaning in the world, that's a solid no. That's a nope from me. That is not a cliche that we can live with. Something you should know about me is I really, really hate cliches. And I spend a lot of time thinking and talking about how the things that we lightly accept as conventional wisdom are often entirely wrong and in some cases dangerous. One of my favorite thinkers, Hannah Arendt, had this to say about cliches. Clichés, stock phrases, adherence to conventional standardized codes of expression and conduct have the socially recognized function of protecting us against reality. 
that is against the claim on our thinking attention that all events and facts make by virtue of their experience. So I want to say something about this idea that blood is thicker than water. The over-reliance on the trope of genetic family, nuclear family, funny that it has the word nuclear in it, <laughs> and of particular obligations that one owes to one's family that supersede one's greater obligations to the world is not only a form of lazy thinking, it's also a deeply problematic way of being in the world. The idea that I owe something to a particular group of people because we're genetically related because we look alike, is rooted in a fundamentally ethnocentric and nationalistic way of being in the world. It's not only heteropatriarchal, it's also potentially fairly racist. It is the blood is thicker than water mentality that has white folks calling the police when they see black and brown folks walking, sleeping, hanging out at Starbucks, or taking a tour on a college campus. It is the conscious decision that the other is a threat to the imagined us. When I think about what we must be called to do in the world, it is to value the body and indeed the soul of the other as much as we value our own bodies and souls and to value the other not because we have to, not because we are contractually obligated to do so, but because we have chosen to. If we have to choose between blood and water, we must choose water every single time because water is a justice issue. People die from lack of water. They die from unclean water. They die in the desert because their bodies have been deemed illegal. They suffer the privatization of water in Flint, Michigan and Standing Rock and Palestine or from the rising waters that increasingly threaten to destroy their communities as climate change continues to threaten Tuvalu and the Solomon Islands and the Maldives. So yeah, if I have to choose between blood and water, I am going to choose water every single time. And as a person of faith, the image of water runs deep in our religious imagination. It is through a ritual with water that people become integrated into the fictive kinship whether that be through the mikvah in Judaism or baptism in Christianity. We have wudu in Islam, water as is one of the most common offerings on shrines in Buddhism, and sacred water ceremonies as a central element of several indigenous faith traditions. So I thought it might be appropriate to end with posing this question to you as my fictive kin, as the people that I choose that comes to us from Chief Arval Looking Horse of the Lakota Nation, who writes, did you think that the creator would create unnecessary people in a time of such terrible danger? Know that you yourself are essential to this world. Understand both the blessing and the burden of that. You yourself are desperately needed to save the soul of this world. Did you really think you were put here for something less? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Welty, for that message and that challenge. And now will you please join me in the spirit of prayer. Spirit of life, we gather today with one another and with you to honor the growth of our lives. In these moments together, we celebrate the joys and accomplishments we have shared and recognize the struggles of this community. Through hope and conviction, we have applied our wisdom and grown throughout these years. 
We acknowledge that some days were more difficult than others, but we have persevered. May each graduate be filled with pride and joy for reaching the end of this endeavor. May we be strong in the paths known and unknown. May we be wise in our choices and courageous in our actions. May we be caring and compassionate. May we meet life's adventures with a clear mind and a bold heart. And may our integrity be a gift to the world. And may you be with us always. Amen. So friends, you are not the same person you were when you arrived on this campus. Your time at Worcester has changed you, has changed your families, has changed this community. You have grown, you have gained new knowledge, you have forged new relationships. You have persevered, you have stood strong, and you have forged and been a force for change. I'm grateful for the gifts and the voices of each person on the stage this morning, but I'm also grateful for the gifts that each of you has offered and shared with the Worcester community. You have each put down roots here, and you have left this place transformed. As Dr. Bolton said, these next 24 hours will feel like a hurried blur, a time of intense celebration, intertwined with hard goodbyes and questions about what is next. And so as we close this space this morning, I invite you to take the leaf that many of you received as you came in. This leaf which our student organizers chose to symbolize the growth that you have undergone here also contains a set of seeds. And as you hold it in your hand, I invite you to take a moment to pause and consider. Consider who it is that has nurtured you into being over your time here. Consider what new seeds of opportunity and wisdom have been planted. Consider who it is that has helped you to grow. And as we prepare for all that awaits, I also invite you to consider where you are going from here, what seeds of change you will be planting born of your Worcester experience, what possibilities, what innovations, what kinships you will forge in this next stage of your life. And so friends, take these seeds, both literal and metaphorical, with you as you go from this space, as you go from here and plant them with intention wherever you find yourself next. And may this day, this next 24 hours, the days and decades to come, be filled with world-changing possibility, love that knows no bounds, and fellowship that never ends. May it be so. May it be so. Amen.